Okay, uh, I'd like to welcome you and thank you again for doing this. Um, the first question I'd like to ask is that, um, was there a film that you saw in the last year or so or two years where you were particularly impressed with the score? I love uh, Gary Yershon's score for Mr. Turner. Mm. I thought that score was just so inventive and bold. And I, it, was, it was a score that I, I saw the movie and then went home and had to immediately listen to the soundtrack and try to figure out what, what these harmonies are or atonality is. It, it confused me in the best way. I mean, it worked perfectly in the movie, and then I had to go home and, and figure out what it was, and I, it took me a while to just sort of wrap my head around like what he was doing. It, just a really great score. Thanks. Yeah, I think for me, maybe um, Mika Levy's score, both for Jackie, but also mm -hmm. Under the Skin, just because mm -hmm. in Jackie, yeah, the way she used strings, the way she used the orchestra was um, like in a really unique way that I hadn't heard before. And um, a lot of the string writing, I feel like I kind of similarly like went back and listened to immediately just to check out what she was doing. And then Under the Skin was just so weird and mm. so different that uh, it really caught my attention the first time I heard it. Mary Poppins Returns has been such a gargantuan mm -hmm. project that I've only just finished with. I haven't seen anything or gone anywhere, <laughs> seen anyone. Hello, it's <laughs> nice to see you humans. I'm just crawling out. Uh, in the last year on the projects you worked on this year, did you have um, like a, an aha moment or, or, a, or a breakthrough moment? Yeah, um, for I do a show called Dear White People on Netflix and like, mm -hmm. With that show last season, I started to um, improvise a lot more in the beginning of my writing process. I think that usually I would kind of spend time figuring out like what tempo I wanted to write at and, and really be writing more to a click than anything. And I think this year I started to approach it more like a jazz pianist and, and just play along to things and move with like with the way that the actors would move or the way that the, the dialogue is moving and everything. And I found that it actually allowed me to be a little bit more fluid and write things in a little bit more of like an organic way instead of trying to force things. Um, and so, yeah, I found that like kind of playing along to things and responding as though I'm like accompanying somebody as a, as a pianist has been like a new thing for me. That's exactly my story of, of really? film scoring. Like I never could figure out how people could choose a tempo first and then try to write like a whole cue or, or the most part of a cue to a predetermined tempo, although I get you could kind of figure out what the pace of the scene is and, and, and what beat might match that. But I'm like you, I'm an accompanist, really. Mm. And, and to me, the movie is like a, a ballet. People are dancing and I got to figure out how to... So it's so, just yeah. so fantastic to, you know, we never get to talk <laughs> amongst each other. So yeah. it's so <laughs> wonderful to hear that. Everyone says that when we do the Composer yeah. Roundtable. You guys don't get to actually get together too often. Justin, how about you on uh, uh, First Man? It's about a, br a breakthrough. A breakthrough moment. moment, yeah. I feel like there are, there's a breakthrough moment every day of some kind. Um, different kind of breakthrough moments. Early on, there's the, for us, there's that composing phase where it's like finally you stumble upon the right melodies. Those mm -hmm. are breakthroughs when they happen because you're just searching, 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 and then finally you come to the right one, the one that Damien loves, the one that just feels right for him, most importantly. Um, and then later on, other kinds of breakthroughs, in instrumentation breakthroughs. Um, I remember for this movie, we had some ideas going in, um, doing a lot of work during pre-production just to find sounds. And, and so we, we knew we wanted to use theremin, we knew we wanted to use orchestra, but it wasn't until later when, um, when we were looking at picture, um, actually scoring to the, the scenes that uh, we got the idea to use harp. Harp never kind of occurred to us until we got the picture and started to feel how delicate and how, um, you know, kind of documentary style it was. How do you balance uh, your own personal style with either the, the style of the film or the style of the director? I think I actually finally have an answer to your question. So, <laughs> I'm lucky enough that this this film, 
that uh, uh, Mary Poppins Returns. I feel like I've been writing, trying to write this score for my whole career and <laughs> forcing it down the throats of other directors and uh, who must walk away and go, why is this schmuck writing like it's a Mary Poppins movie? <laughs> and then suddenly, <laughs> I'm with a guy saying, write like it's Mary Poppins. It is a Mary Poppins movie. So I was just, it was like going to a department store and I had something happen that never happens. It's like, put a piece of clothing on <laughs> off, the, off the rack, off the, and it fit. So that was just, you know, I'm still floating on a cloud. Mary Poppins. Who came back? They've come to look after the bank's children. Us? Oh, yes, you too. But we don't need a nanny. We have grown up a good deal in the past year. Well, we'll have to see what can be done about that. No, not yet. For me, with, with Green Book, a lot of it was um, kind of trying to figure out where the, the, the stories about Don Shirley, or uh, one of the characters, Don Shirley is a pianist, and he was heavily inspired by a lot of classical composers, even though, and trained as a classical pianist, even though he was made to play jazz. And so, because there's a lot of his music in the film, we, we tried to figure out how to incorporate some of, some of his influences in the score, like that sound. And between that and like also, Pulling, um, I was doing a lot of research on like Negro spirituals and original melodies from that era, and it kind of created uh, something that I could use as like a, like a focal point around the whole score. And so I was able to like create these arrangements or these orchestrations around like melodies that I was writing as if it was just like a an old folk song or like a Negro spiritual, and and orchestrate them in like whatever way I wanted to. And so I think that it was it was with that I was able to like do something that served the story in the best way, but still, like you said, have my own kind of sound to it. Put this down. Falling in love with you was the easiest thing I've ever done. Nothing matters to me but you. And every day I'm alive, I'm aware of this. I loved you the day I met you. I love you today. And I will love you the rest of my life. Justin. Did you feel any pressure on uh, First Man, given the success of La La Land? Yeah, I felt a lot yeah. of pressure. Um, one of the first conversations I had with Damien, um, he told me that it had to sound really different than anything we'd done, um, and and that I, you know, I knew that I couldn't rely on the same tools that I'd been using. It, it I couldn't just. Uh, compose and orchestrate music and put it in front of musicians and have it played and have it recorded. Um, there would have to be a lot of, there would have to be experimentation going into this score to just find new sounds, new ways to make music. Um, we talked early on about a lot of different kinds of electronic music. Um, Damien suggested a uh, theremin, so I got one of those. I had to learn. Did you learn? Yeah, yeah, I, I played it. Um, there was a lot of stuff that I, I, I wasn't, I had never used and had, had to learn. And, and, and Damien told me that early on, he said, you're gonna have to spend a lot of time figuring out some new things for this. So I just, early on when the movie, when we were in pre-production and then when they were off in Atlanta shooting it, I was just trying to, I was watching YouTube tutorials on synths wow. and, and, and some production stuff. I was getting some of the equipment and just playing around with it, learning how it works. Damien and I definitely share certain sensibilities, share a certain melodic sensibility, a certain sensibility for uh, film music in terms of how it can be scored thematically uh, across a score. So there were definitely certain um, common commonalities and shared instincts that we have uh, that have carried through all the, all the scores we've done, but just on a, a sonic level and on a instrumentation level, there was just a lot, of, a lot of new stuff that we hadn't used before. And so that was exciting, but also a little scary to have to jump in and learn all these new things. Yeah, I bet. On, um, Mark, on Mary Poppins, did you? Did Mary you... Poppins Returns. Mary Poppins Returns, I'm sorry. So, <laughs> no, no. Thank you for correcting me because uh, that's what the question is about. Did you, did you feel a need to, to update this, the, the sound to make it more contemporary? Because in many ways it's a very traditional musical, but it does have a contemporary feel to it. Was that intentional? Well, I mean, the, the story takes place now in the early 30s, and, mm -hmm. the, orig and the first film uh, is like 1910. But it had a sound like it's in the same neighborhood, mm -hmm. literally. And so it was more embracing 
uh, a, the style of, you know, that, the classic musicals of, of the early 60s and of Mary Poppins. And so, um, although we've made our own movie with our own themes and our own emotions, there are all the ways through it, you know, whispers of the first film. Mm -hmm. Happily so. I mean, we wouldn't have had it any other way. Mm. Uh, Chris, on uh, Green Book, Peter Farrelly is known for comedy, and this is, um, this is a relatively serious movie. Um, how did you approach that? Was that a, uh, was that a, were you concerned about that at all? You know, I, I was until I read the script, I think. I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, hearing what the story was about, I was unsure about how he would take it on, but once I read the script and, and read how they were handling the story, I was immediately pretty taken by it. You know, I think that they, they tell a story in a way that I think is, is really timely and really kind of necessary right now. And like, I think it shows how people from totally different worlds can actually have a conversation and actually take the time to respect and then therefore understand one another and understand mm -hmm. that they might not really get what the other person is dealing with and some of their difficulties and so on and so forth. And so, yeah, kind of like feeling with that and, and empathizing with that like mm -hmm. kind of um, uh, experience, I think immediately made me pretty excited about it. So yeah, after, after reading the script, I didn't have any reservations at all. all right. um, how important is uh, representation in the composer world? And do you feel like it's improving? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I definitely think it's improving. I mean, I feel like, um, you know, it's, it's a tough thing where one, I think on, on some level, uh, this composer the other day, Michael Abels said that he feels like it's a, a broken doorbell problem, that it's not actually, there's nothing wrong with the pipeline. There are definitely plenty of people that are ready for the opportunities. And I think that you can see on one side that um, Hollywood's definitely doing a great job of trying to fix that doorbell or trying to, whether it be like inclusion writers or whatever it is to try to like bring some more exposure to that. But, um, but also I think that you have composers like myself or composers of color that are trying to, um, I guess, focus on education. Because I think that's the second thing is that you have a lot of people of color that don't even recognize it as an opportunity. And so mm -hmm. I think that that's kind of the work that's being done on both sides. And I, I see a lot of progress for sure. Mark and Justin, you've worked with the same director multiple times. How um, does that help with the process, I imagine? Is there any kind of downside to that at all? This is my fourth movie mm -hmm. uh, with Damien. And, uh, I, I love working with him. Um, each time it seems like it gets, certain parts get more efficient, like we just kind of know what the other person is thinking and we just know how to, how to dive in. A lot of our processes haven't changed at all since we were in college. Um, there are always new challenges, new things to figure out each time. Um, it's, it's, the process never takes any shorter. In fact, it seems to get longer each time, <laughs> but um, we kind of, know what the other person is thinking each time we have a little bit more of a, um, a sort of d direct line into each other's brains and that just makes certain parts of it easier and uh yeah yeah mark how about you i love working with the you know the same people because of the friendship and the hang i mean i realize obviously the music is the most important mm -hmm. and the, and and the relationship about the music but also you know you are holed up basically with that one person it might be the person you're going to see the most for quite a few months. And it's wonderful to have that kind of relationship with someone that you can just, your family, and you can laugh about stuff that has nothing to do with the movie and just have common stuff about, you know, your lives. Is there a piece of a career advice you've received that was particularly helpful? Kind of, I mean, I've, I've already naturally been this way, but I think most people are, but like to just be a student always, you know, mm -hmm. and always be studying things. Like any time that I have uh, any break in between things, I'm always trying to like figure out some specific aspect to my composition or even playing that I want to work on. And, and um, yeah, so I kind of use as much time as I can just to like keep absorbing information and continue to be a student, yeah. All right, one more question. When you were 17, what was your favorite song? I was really into Ben Folds when I was 17. <laughs> I still am, I, I love him, but, um, I was, I was listening to a lot of uh, Whatever, Never, Amen when I was 17. That's a good choice. Huh. How about you, Chris? Um, I feel like when I was 17, I was really, I only listened to jazz pretty much. I feel like once I got to college, I stopped a little bit. But when I was in um, high school, I feel like uh, Lush Life was maybe my favorite 
oh, yeah. song around then, mainly because I knew that Billy Strayhorn wrote it when he was 17, and it's such like a devastatingly sad and dark and, and beautiful song that, yeah, I kind of fell in love with it when I was, when wow. I was in high school. Did you have any friends at 17 who were listening to yeah, similar yeah, music? Yeah, most yeah. of, yeah. I mean, I went to an arts high school, and oh, so like, right, I right. was surrounded by kids. I, I had like the smallest record collection out of all my oh, friends. Yeah. I was like trying to catch up to them. But yeah, we mostly just listened to like things that it kind of stopped at like 1969. It's like really where like our music taste stopped when we were in high school, which is pretty funny. Yeah. How about you, Mark? I can't remember when I was 17. <laughs> <laughs> Just I was already speaking. I, I moved to New York when I was 16 and was already in show business and I think was already working with Bette Midler wow. when I was 17. So whatever we were rehearsing at the time, um, can't think of a specific song when I was 17. Who's your favorite? You have a favorite artist at that time? I love the song at 17. <laughs> okay, uh, that works. No, no, no particular artist. I you know, there's just too many to to love. All right, fair enough. And Rock in the Suburbs, that was also out. <laughs> Listening to a lot of that. <laughs> oh, that's great. All right, thank you for the great conversation. I really appreciate it. Yeah. You're welcome.